Hello ladies and welcome to my blog. I'm making these videos for my blog so I'm providing a link below. Please go to my blog, click on that link and listen to it on the blog where it's embedded. And also there are no comments here on YouTube but you can comment away on my blog which is easier for me to monitor than to have a lot of social media. I only have, right now I only have email and I have uh, this I do these videos for my blog and I think that's enough for me. I just don't want to be too preoccupied on social media so I am just asking you to go to my blog and leave a comment if this has been helpful because that is where I get some of my ideas and you also stimulate my interest in talking about new things. And so if you are new here, this is a house keeping radio where you can listen as you go. You know, I love to watch videos of women doing housework and there's an old saying, I love work. I could sit and watch it for hours, but that's just the trouble. I have to stop and watch it and see all the beautiful things they are doing. So I don't do that unless I'm relaxing and I'm just wanting to watch something to uh, entertain me. And I would like to just provide some talking so that I could keep you company, maybe read something to you, or just talk about homemaking, or talk about the life of the homemaker. And if uh, if that's helpful, please let me know, because I hope to talk at least half an hour, maybe more. And we always break it up into three things, and that is the, your appearance, and your actual homemaking, and uh, personal things like dealing with people, or dealing with different uh, personalities of the family and I always hope to leave it on a positive level and leave you feeling better uh, and when you leave and a little more inspired and so this way too you know you don't have to go somewhere to get inspired you can just stay home and you don't have to invite someone I used to invite ladies over to my ladies Bible class when I uh, needed some kind of special event, you know, we, we do study the Bible and we have a chapter every week. And sometimes I would just want something special. So I'd invite someone over, like a special speaker, a lady that I knew from another congregation to come over and talk to us, usually about organization or housekeeping. And I found out over the years, they didn't explain it as well as I needed to have it explained. <laughs> And finally, I just discovered that everybody has their own way of getting out of their messes and developing a routine and being happy at home. And I decided to quit. Uh, actually, actually, I had to. I felt like I had to give them a gift, a monetary gift, and then, you know, a little gift bag with some things, you know, to help with their transportation. And I uh, decided I, we couldn't afford that. The ladies' class couldn't afford that. So... I started speaking myself at the end of every class just a little bit of homemaking tips and uh, it has just invigorated us all and you know after you've been in a ladies Bible class for like my mother-in-law was the one that started it way back in the 1960s and now I'm here and I've been doing it almost 30 years well after a while you need some kind of variety and so speaking of variety what I did this time for the ladies Bible classes, I, beside their tea table, we always have tea afterwards, kind of a lunch. I don't like to send them home without something to eat because they leave at noon. And today I gave them each a little newsletter and it was wrapped, tied in this little scroll with ribbon around it. So I'm going to read what was in it for you. And first I'm going to show you my teacup. This is called, now, it's called Prairie Rose for the Canadians because it's one of their state, I believe the Alberta state flower. And in Alaska, when I was growing up there on the homestead out in the wilderness in the log house, this was called the Wild Rose and called the Alaska Wild Rose. Well, my mother said they grew in uh, the prairies too. And then here in Oregon, these things are everywhere. I believe in nearly every state you can find this Wild Rose. And this is made by Royal Adderley. It's different than Royal Albert. I just quite like the shape of it. In fact, I think I like it a little better. And uh, But these are very hard to find. When we first got married, we lived in Canada. And um, my husband got me a set of these with a 
with a teapot and at the time you could find them everywhere but now they say you're lucky to get anyone to part with them and if you do they're very very expensive I have four cups and I have the teapot and the sugar and the creamer so that's uh, I call that the wild rose and I'm particularly fond of it because it grew in Alaska here in Oregon it grows in the ditches it grows just everywhere and even uh, out here in the, on the farmland it grows along the edge of the people's property so it's it's quite a prolific grows and so I'm going to read from this right here that I made and this is what it looks like I just I just sat here this morning before they came and I thought well the table is all ready I'm all dressed so what should I do so I thought well I'd like to send them home something so I wrote them I hand wrote them a newsletter you know it's so easy just to put it to pen and it's done but when I started using the computer for it I thought this is you know and sometimes it jumps the page and then I try to send it to the printer which is in Mr. S's office and it'll just totally do crazy things it won't come out the same or cut off the edge <laughs> So I just decided I would hand write it and print it myself. I'll get a picture of that for you. And I called it the elect lady, which is what uh, uh, the Apostle John uh, used to describe the church, the Lord's church. He called it the elect lady. And I thought that's really, really nice. So it makes you feel refined and special. So I called it the elect lady and I started it with tea. And I suggested they stop for tea. And I said, sit somewhere with a cheerful magazine and let life stop for a few moments. Gather your thoughts. Lift your thoughts to God, being confident of his enabling your work today. That is so important. I know so many of us just get up and our feet hit the floor and we're off and running. Many of us don't even really get fully dressed or get our hair done till afternoon. So that's why I suggest you start out with your um, appearance and get dressed and wear something also that makes you feel good and feel happy and I really think it's important not to get bored at home but I think it's important not to get bored with your clothes and that's one of the things that motivated me when I was very young to learn to sew and that because I knew that I could have a brand new outfit to wear a brand new dress and of course we had been getting the um, the secondhand clothing that was shipped to the area for um, benevolence, you know, for uh, poverty-stricken people. And we dig through there and find all kinds of delightful things. But I found out that if I could sew, my clothes would always be brand new. And when my children were growing up, they didn't have to wear secondhand clothes because I could sew and they were brand new. And often better and less uh, expensive than even some place like Goodwill, where I didn't know where they had been and I'd get them home and find out something that I hadn't seen before that was a, a something that needed to be repaired and that to me that I might as well just make my own if I'm going to have to re-sew something. So I think uh, it's important not to be bored with your clothes and there are catalogs you know they're a little bit more expensive than sewing your own or going to Goodwill but if you can't find anything uh, and Walmart too is a is a good place if just anything you get a a bright top to wear with your skirt and um, just you don't have to suffer and wear old clothes that are coming apart and I think it's really important for your esteem and your demeanor at home because you're the cheerleader of your family so you're going to have to dress in a way that makes you happy too and the children will absolutely love it I've heard many testimonies of ladies who leave comments about how happy their children are my children used to come to see what I was wearing and they wanted to wear something that matched the color <laughs> so I thought that was interesting they were extremely interested in that so um, I also went and talked to uh, in this little newsletter about the garden and I suggested trying a taste of mint leaves for a freshening of the breath you know if you can't find a, a breath mint or and you're a little concerned about your breath go and get um, a couple of mint leaves and just chew on them and chew a few leaves for an upset tummy you know that's such a great idea always wash them first you know rinse them under water and then I love to take people on a herbal tour of my garden and I have them pick up something like uh, sage rosemary thyme uh, mint and all the other delightful herbs I have that just keep growing and uh, have them pick a piece and then pinch it between their fingers and rub it, rub it on their hands like this. 
and then smell it. And how wonderful that is, how that clears the senses and how it often even might even help um, in, improve the mood. So I think that's really important. And if you don't have them and you're not growing them, you can go to the grocery store and they sell them fresh in a little plastic container. You can get just about everything. And I, I really think it's worth having. And rosemary is one of my favorite. So I also suggested that they look when they get up in the morning. And it's, I, I'll just read it to you. And it's about the sun. Look in the morning's first light for the many places in your home where sunshine lays a beam across a table, the floor, a wall. Or just let your arm feel its warmth through a window. Isn't that delightful? These are kind of the sensory things I taught my children. I trained their senses to notice things like this. And we often love to watch a sunbeam come through and all the dust, little particles of dust through it and observe it. And they would play with their little cars or toys in a sunbeam. They, they were fascinated with it. I think it's so important to have these, I called it a census tour. And we would learn to see things, to notice things. You have to tell them what to notice because that's part of you know, why you're there. And one of the reasons that I think it's so important for uh, not to let your children just go off on their own all of a sudden just because they're 18 or 21 or just because they got married and just kind of get out of their lives. I don't think that's all necessarily necessary. For one thing, they have not experienced a stages of life that you already have experienced. And they will need, they may not think so right now, but they will need to know what did you do when you were at this stage of your life? What did you do when someone in your family did such and such? What was your response? What should, um, what was your experience with it? What, uh, did you have good uh, results with this reaction or whatever? And I think it's really important also to um, to impart uh, your experiences to them. And if they are not open to that, you can always write them down. You can always keep a blog or you can keep a, uh, a diary and write a lot of things down. You don't have to let your good work or the work that God has wrought in you, you don't have to just let it go stale. And I don't really believe anybody's ready to part with their parents uh, and their parents' experience and their uh, ideas. I think even in different age groups, we can work together and work with each other to do something. To you know, we can have projects together and we can all grow together. And uh, parents and grandparents are still growing too. And um, you know, we we love that scripture that uh, um, God is looking to work a good work in you. Well, he's looking for to work a good work in us, too, even as we grow older. And I think it's really important to, you know, I think it's comforting. When I was, my mother uh, died when I was in my early 60s. And I was so glad that I had her all those years because I could call her and say, uh, what did you do? Did you experience this? And most times she had. She, she recognized some of these things. So I think it's really important to impart your ideas and your things that you have learned uh, better of, you know, things that maybe mistakes you've made and you, you learned better. I think that's really, really important. Now, I also wrote on here something about friendship. Past gestures of friendship were in the little baskets of pretty papers, writing supplies, and tiny books filled with autographs or pasted pictures. And uh, so I put a little basket there. But I wanted to talk a little bit about friendship because that seemed to be a, a, a point at which uh, some people were a little confused. And But first I want to talk about how I had said, I'm skipping over to the people part right now. I am going to go to the homemaking pretty soon. But um, that... Uh, I mentioned Plan B after you've had a social event, like after uh, the after church is over or the ladies' class is over, or you've had uh, somebody over for tea, or you've been somewhere and it's 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 a little uh, the emotional is high, you know, and you come home and you can feel an awful letdown. And I mentioned have Plan B, have uh, another plan that comes afterwards and. Part of that is because if you've been in a social situation, 
whether it's family or friends or anybody, and there's been some disagreeable things that have happened that uh, it kind of eases the shock of that, if, I, if you want to call it a shock. But let's say somebody just wasn't very nice to you or wasn't very nice to other people around them and you didn't enjoy whatever it was, the social thing that you did. And uh, if you have a, a second plan and, and your whole life is not centered around that one event, you can overcome it so much more easily if you have something more exciting to do afterwards. And so I always like to plan something afterwards and you know I'll do my shopping afterwards or I will maybe come home or start a project that I've always wanted to do or I've been saving my Victoria magazine and that's when I'm going to sit down with it and uh, or have a special friend that I've decided to call and that really really helps so that the these things do not loom larger than life in your life in your in your day when you have somebody else or something else to do afterwards it's like I said after church when we were growing up my father would take us on a ride uh, we would go on a scenic ride on the way home we had a, a loop that we followed and we went up on a ridge and we looked over you know the town and the bay and everything so I just wanted to mention that because it kind of eases the um, discomfort of uh, maybe some disgruntled people that you've been around. I've had to learn that, you know, because of being a preacher's wife, because not everybody is in the same stage of maturity. Not everybody knows better than to spoil a, um, you know, company or a group or a, a fellowship that's going on. Not everybody knows how to behave. And so you have to have something else. So you don't take it in too deeply. Now, we have the problem of friends that, for some reason, uh, just don't want to acknowledge you anymore. And it might just come out of the blue. You don't know what you did, and you spend hours agonizing over it. Well, I'll tell you, there are a number of things going on here. First of all, there are people who will investigate you so severely that the, until they find something they don't like, they'll find some little, little tiny fault because, you know, you're supposed to be perfect. <laughs> according to some people and uh, once they find this this little fault they can't overlook it and they drop you and then they'll go on to someone else but if they're doing that to you they probably went on to do it to someone else so take comfort in that and the other thing is they might have heard some gossip about you and they believe it and they don't come to you and they don't try to straighten it out because there are some people that want to believe the best but uh, there are others who automatically believe the worst. And they always, uh, I've noticed this too, they always believe the first lie they were told. And you can talk and talk and talk to them and they might brighten up and they say, oh yeah, yeah. But then they go back to the first lie they were told and they, they, it's just like their, their mind is set in concrete on certain things. The other thing is that this person may have said something about you that was rude or wrong or untruthful or and they feel very um, they feel very guilty about it so they don't want anything to do with you the other thing is that some people do not understand friendship and they know that eventually they're going to have to reciprocate they're going to have to call you back or they're going to have to check on you find out how you are or they might have to uh, you know, give you some little uh, gift or an invitation because you gave them an invitation and they don't want to do it. So it's easier just to cut you off and then they're free of all that obligation. So don't beat yourself up too much when someone runs off and they don't want to have anything to do with you. Now this can be pretty severe and I think this began a long time ago, but of course we haven't been here before, have we? So when it happens to you, it's new and you think this is a crazy world but apparently this has gone on for a long time it's pretty normal and uh, you can probably read about it in the old novels <laughs> I don't know maybe Jane Austen had something to say about it and uh, so I thought that was kind of amusing that it's been going on for a long time and like I said if they have done it to you they've probably done it to someone else and it won't be long before they you know there are some people that get very excited about you and uh, then they want to find out all they can all of a sudden all about you 
and then they get bored and they move on. And, uh, you know, that's a false friend. It's called a fair weather friend. You know, they're happy when everything is good and when you're doing well. But if you have a problem and you want to talk to them, that angers them because you were there for them to talk to you and unload on you. So when then when you feel confident enough in this friend that, oh, well, maybe I could share this little this little worry that I have, they get very offended because you shared something like that with them. I don't quite understand the reasoning behind that. I haven't quite figured that one out. But uh, they feel very offended, but they can unload on other people. and and But they won't tolerate anybody else having a problem or a fault. So that's just something that you want to consider, and don't put your don't put your life into friendships. Now this can happen with your own relatives too, your your dearest uh, sister or somebody all of a sudden wants to have a problem with you. What I have to tell you is that you cannot let it knock you down and debilitate you and immobilize you so that you can't get out of bed. You've got to rise above it. And the way that you do that is you succeed. You'll say, well, uh, they're not allowing a friendship, so I'm just going to go beyond them. And and even with children that are uh, grown up, but they're not uh, thriving and they're not communicating with you and they're not uh, you know, doing as you had raised them to do, the best thing to do is be everything that you wanted that child to be. Did you want them to do a better this or a better that? Or did you want them to be interested in something or did you want them to be mature and happy or did you want them to be creative did you want them to be hospitable did you want them to be a Christian then you do it and you you just everything that make a list and everything that you wished for them and tried to teach them do it yourself and of course there's most of us who have homeschooled have um, ha we've had our regrets because there wasn't enough time and to teach them everything or to go through everything and then the new book comes out that we that was after they were 18 you know and they got jobs and and so I mean I'll that's why I got that handwriting book the other day it's, oh I thought that would be so interesting because to me it's like art and so I and I like to I'll go into the home here because the home it's so exciting sometimes and one of the times that I feel the best is when I have cleaned it up, you know, when it's all swept and all the little corners are cleaned out and everything's um, arranged the way I like it. Now, of course, you're watching a video and you're only going to see the cleanest corner. You're not going to see what I see in front of me. And that's one thing I love about this era we're living in is that I don't have to um, make sure the dishes and laundry are done in order to invite you over. You're invited in right now to this little corner. But, you know, the home, I got to thinking about it as a retreat. And one of my favorite things to do after it's all swept and all cleaned up is to walk through, do a walk through, just walk through and observe. And it reminded me when my children were home and they were a lot younger, we'd, we'd uh, quickly clean it all up. And then I'd say, all right, we're going to go on a tour. And they would follow me around and I would present each room. And I would say where this desk came from, where this picture came from, where that quilt came from why the furniture is arranged the way that it is what what is the meaning of the colors and the rug and the uh, and what the books what is meant by the books and and the little collection of letters and who that was from and the artwork and just explain everything and i would explain who uh, if it was a print sometimes i could go to walmart and get a print that was actually a, a print of a famous painting and that was good enough and i would tell them about the artist and of course now we have the internet we can get all that information so much easier but I used to have to go a long ways to find information on all this but we would go on a tour and uh, I enjoyed it I don't know if they even remember they're awfully young but I remember taking them on a home tour after it had been cleaned up so they could see it with new eyes and appreciate it and love it and uh, do you remember in uh, wives and daughters episode I believe it was three and four three or four, um, where uh, Molly's stepmother and her stepsister had been invited to London and were going to London for two weeks or something like that. And uh, Molly was walking along with her arm linked into her father's and uh, her father said, well, we won't know what to do with ourselves. What will we do while they're gone? And she says, oh, 
everything that's ungenteel and unrefined. <laughs> and she said, we will, we will eat toast and melted cheese with our fingers. <laughs> and just, she mentioned a couple of other things. I don't quite know what the quote is, but he said, and he was the doctor, you know, and he put on this false uh, image of, uh, of being proper. And he said, by toil and labor, I've reached a fair height of refinement, and I won't be pulled down again. <laughs> I thought that was so clever. And uh, I don't know if you remember, I listen to wives and daughters sometimes while I'm working in the kitchen. That's my hardest job is the kitchen. Because as soon as it's cleaned up, it's time to cook another meal. And we eat at home, and I like to cook everything, you know, from um, from scratch, as they say. And it's just so delicious. And uh, so I just thought that you would enjoy that. And I also wanted to talk a little bit about some of the, the homeschool material that I have. And in, when I began homeschooling in the early 1980s, there was no, there were no catalogs, no homeschool curriculum. I had to go to bookstores and look through our own things to see what we had that we could use. And all I had was a dictionary, and a, my husband bought me a chalkboard. That was back in the 80s, you know, before they had the dry erase or anything else. And he bought me a globe. And I then we had a set of... Um, I don't know what they were called, but there was a book about little slender volumes about each country of the world, of their time life or whatever. Um, and, and we got, you know, at least they could locate a place and they could say something about the food and the language and, and recognize a picture of some of the scenery or important places. And then I would, we had a, a catalog called Dover and Dover uh, catalog if you called them or you wrote to them and you had the name of the book that you knew about and the author, they would find it and they would print it. And then they would put it in their catalog. And a lot of people did that. And this one was called, uh, we'll start with the American Boys Handy Book. Now, this is not a homeschool book, but this is all, what we had. This is what we used. And uh, it had a, it's not a Christian book, but it was originally written for boys. Um, to learn to do things with their hands, learn to do things, and it was divided into seasons, and so, it, and it's the actual reprint, like it te teaches them how to make a toy boat for fishing, and it also taught them how to make kites, and here's one that looks like a turtle, tell them how to make, make their own stuff, and it also showed them how to make a tent, and how to make, you know, things like soap bubbles, paper fireworks, homemade hunting apparatus, decoys, and uh, how to make a homemade banjo. And well, let me just read some, I'll just read the, the chapters here. So spring uh, is a kite, all kinds of kites, and fishing. And homemade fishing tackle, how to make a rod, a tin and spool reel, the fork stick reel, the homemade nets. And uh, teaches a little bit about uh, the fish and the water and the inhabitants of the water. And how to keep a freshwater, how to make and keep a freshwater aquarium. And then in summer, knots, bins, and hitches, how to make knots. And... The water telescope and trawl fishing, homemade boats, how to rig and sail small boats. Now, when I was younger, my brothers made a raft out of wood, piece like logs, and actually sailed it. And um, the 4th of July balloons. Now, so, of course, I don't think the Canadians would be too interested in that, but everything else in here would be would be good for the Canadians or for anybody else. I know um, you could substitute the 4th of July balloons for your own patriotic symbols. And uh, how to camp out without a tent. That's interesting. And then the other one is birds. Bird singers, the cornstalk fiddle, the pumpkin vine fife, a pumpkin vine flute, the cane fife, 
the voice disguiser, the locust singer, and the hummer. Bird nesting, how to collect and preserve eggs. Bird's nest, preserving nests. Um, how to take care of wild birds, like once in a while you would find a wild bird and uh, want to rescue it and how to take care of it. Then autumn was um, practical things for boys and how to be an artist. You know, how to shadow pictures and how to draw. That's interesting. And winter is how to build a snow fort. And uh, most of these things we pass down from the parents to the children. But if you didn't have any of those experiences, you would need a book like this. But what I did, I didn't actually take them through the book. I just gave them a book or left it on the coffee table. And then they could just read it for fun. How to make a sled. How to make snowshoes. How to make snow houses and statuary. Um, how to make uh, winter fishing and indoor amusements. How to do indoor things like a literary sketch club. And, you know, when I was growing up, we had a pretend book club. And we would all give book reports or talks. How to make puppets and have a puppet show. How to do a drama. How to make a lantern and a kaleidoscope how to make uh, various whirly gigs and how to make costumes so there's many many things and then of course uh, there's too many illustrations for me to uh, for me to show you but uh, you could go through uh, and they're all of course this is just a reprint of very old books so they're all in just sketches and then we have the American Girl handy book now, I really enjoyed this because there was one section that I liked, and it was how to make a fan. You know, how to make a paper fan, and that was out of a cardstock. You could make it. And I still have one where the ribbons were woven through it, and I still have one somewhere that that my daughter made me. And I, she just took this and looked at the instructions and did it herself. And uh, there, there it is right there. You just cut these separate little slats, and then you punch holes in them and then you weave ribbon through them and then it, it shuts and it opens so I would really recommend this and I'll just read to you uh, how to make a daisy chain and how to uh, preserve flowers so so let me now they'll ha they'll have things in here that maybe you wouldn't want to use like April Fool's Day but but the projects can be adapted to whatever you want, you know. So here, is, here are the, here are the uh, contents in spring. Uh, how to make a Noah's Ark peep show. Uh, wildflowers and their preservation. The walking club. How to create a walking club. Customs in other lands. How to make a lawn tennis net. Um, window decorations and it explains window decorations we don't do that anymore but there was a time when the window of a store was decorated to draw customers in now of course all you see is the back of the paint cans you know or, or some other merchandise but uh, it used to be these windows were created as a separate little box and uh, from the inside you'd open a little door and get in there and you'd, you'd put something there you can see old movies that have the window decorations and I'm trying to think there was a, a recent one I don't know if it was a hallmark or what about a window display and they competed a lot but it brought in the customers and you went to window dressing school you actually did you went to classes that told you how to dress windows I never did locate one but I lived at the end of that in the 60s I think was the last of it I am not sure but uh, someone told me that they had been to window decorating school so they could work in a certain high-end store. And I was always curious about it. I've looked all over the web, have not found any evidence of it, have not found any books about it. This is the only book that talks about window decoration and um, that I had found. I had not found it, but I just would have just loved to have gone to one of those. So how to make a parachute. These are just talking about little little things like, the parachute and the pinwheels, things that you could use in the wind. Um, how to uh, paint a winter landscape. How to 
make up uh, party hats and games for hot weather, a five minute conversation, a singing school, and how to create characters for a play, how to make a hammock. Yeah, you can make a hammock. Um, let me see what that looks like on page 159. Let me see. Uh, we had we made hammocks. We just took a sheet and we tied it to each end of a tree and then we put a chair under it so they wouldn't fall out of it. Um, so I just thought that was interesting. And our children would, uh, and my grandchildren would sit in a hammock that had a chair under it that was homemade and with a stick pretend they were in a boat and they were sailing across the Atlantic. So this is how to make a hammock and this is pretty serious you have to use these uh, knots uh, and, and make it but you know we would just we just would pretend they were happy with that but it shows an illustration of sitting in one there this is old pictures and it was done in 1850 I think this book was written in 1850 but this is brand new because it's a reprint Corn husk flower dolls. Doesn't that sound interesting? How to make a fan. The butterfly fan, the Japanese fan, the daisy fan, the cardboard fan. Now in autumn, how um, to roast uh, hazelnuts and other nuts. Uh, fresh autumn wildflowers. Uh, ornamental gourds. Vases, small decorations, brackets and all kinds of different celebrations uh, how to paint in watercolors how to paint in oil how to model clay and wax how to make your own clay how to make a plaster cast china painting a chapter on frames how to make a picture frame and how to and then thanksgiving is how to create a table uh, displayed with the Thanksgiving decorations on them and how to tell the Thanksgiving story and winter is full of festivities and homemade gifts and also you know we used to when we were growing up we made a lot of gifts for each other and it was so much fun and we made up games we made up board games yes we would take a piece of cardboard from um, a grocery box you know from the like if there was a box of cereal or something we open it up and use it for the board and then we had so much fun making the little pieces that you would move around and we made up the most fantastic games and so there was uh, the use of color in art old-fashioned needlework um, scrapbook and homemade book covers that was fun I really enjoyed that and the boys learned to do that too what to do with old things it's called a heap of rubbish and what to do with it a key and button hook paper paper weight how to make attractive an attractive booth at a fair we used to do that at home you know because there's no shortage of these great big cardboard boxes and sheets and things and we could make a booth it at home and um, have a little table in it and play for hours and hours and hours with uh, pretending we had a store or pretending we were displaying something. So it says how to make the tables at a booth, the decorations, how to appeal to the five senses, um, and different things like that. Window decorations, the how to make window shades, ribbon curtain, how to make drapery of very small scraps and furniture old and new what to do with it how to use it mantelpieces and fireplaces and how to make homemade uh, desserts and so anyway the american girls handy book it's written by i'm just trying to think who wrote it uh, i don't think the same people wrote these but you can find these at dover or just online uh, and they're not very expensive but they're brand new so I wanted to tell you that and then also some tips about the home that you if you're concerned about having too many chemicals in your house which I am I try not to I have a bottle of vinegar white vinegar that I use to clean everything everything from the bathroom to the kitchen 
I do have a little bit of Dawn liquid detergent that I also have in a spray bottle with water that I use to wash hand wash dishes and sometimes the clothes, but I find that I can wash the clothing with the vinegar because um, for some reason in his old age, Mr. S developed uh, an aversion to detergents. And so I couldn't put any on his clothes. Even if it was rinsed, he could tell it was on in so I quit doing that, started using the vinegar, no problem. Even our sheets are done in vinegar, and the smell goes away after a while. But it's a lot easier breathing in our house without any, without any detergents and without any chemicals. But I wanted to read to you about some of these natural tips, and one is bathrooms. A paste of baking soda and water works to soften grime and calcium deposits on sinks, bathtubs, clogged shower heads and drains, etc. Kitchen. Coarse salt sprinkled on half a lemon works as a na natural scouring pad to clean baked on grease for kitchen utensils on oven or stove tops. You know, instead of using that uh, oven cleaner, whatever it's called, is it Mr. Muscle or something, and you leave it in there a while and it foams up, I started using my spray bottle and I'd spray the oven and uh, wipe it out and every day do it and eventually that grime comes off. It doesn't come off as fast as when you use a chemical but it comes off and I went over to the church kitchen and they had uh, an old oven in there that had really collected some grime and I got that all cleaned up and uh, and that's an old stove too and I just did it like going over there every day or every other day, spraying a little vinegar on it, wiping it off. Eventually, it all came off. You do have to let the product, the vinegar, sit on it for a little while. You can't just spray it and wipe it off. Okay, so uh, this, this coarse salt sprinkled on a lemon half also works. Uh, to clean as a cleaning aid in the kitchen and can clean and disinfect walls, countertops, and inside the refrigerator. I use the vinegar inside the refrigerator. Windows. Use a solution of one part distilled water and one part vinegar to spray and clean all windows. Use linen dish towels for a streak-free and lint-free shine. You can still get linen dish towels. I'm not too keen on the dish towels at Walmart and the Dollar Tree now. They have so much synthetic in them and they just they don't wash very well. They all beat up and they also don't, in my opinion, absorb very well or clean very well, but you still can get 100% cotton at Walmart and at Hobby Lobby and at uh, TJ Maxx and Ross Home Goods. You can still, they're a little more expensive, but it's really worth having the cotton in your house or the linen. Furniture. A cup of olive oil combined with half a cup of lemon juice is an excellent furniture polish. The lemon cleans off the surface stains and dirt while the olive oil leaves a shiny appearance. Linens. Swap out linens around the house, changing bed sheets, slip covers, and tablecloths. Wash and dry the old textiles and store with a sachet of dried lavender to stave off moths. Okay, so lemons and oranges. These citrus essentials work as natural deodorizers. Simply add the juice to the bottom of the sink or on surfaces like kitchen countertops to revive the room. Baking soda. That's soda bicarb. Soda bicarb neutralizes bad smells and can be mixed with a little water to get rid of grime. Vinegar. A mixture of equal parts of vinegar, vinegar such as apple cider vinegar or white vinegar and water can be used to prevent mold, clean glassware, and deodorize surfaces. It won't leave behind a strong scent once the surface is dry. Yes, it will. The smell will disappear. Be careful not to use uh, acidic vinegar on vinyl, marble, or granite surfaces. All natural soaps mixed with water are useful to clean up any mess. Try botanical soaps for an intoxicating fragrance. I just love smelling those. Lavender. Lavender not only disinfects, it calms the senses and can be used. Now, I didn't, I've never liked lavender or, or the rose. I thought that rose and lavender were two scents that were just too strong for me. But I'm starting to appreciate the fact that it, it actually it seems to clear the air. It seems to disinfect and neutralize everything, so you don't always smell the lavender. But I, I'm starting to appreciate it a little bit more. It is a little bit stronger than 
orange, for example, but I I think your you, your tastes change as you get older. Uh, I could just not stand lavender or rose. They were they were just, they were just too um, weren't sweet enough for me when I was younger. But I'm liking it now. Um, lavender re repels insects, and they used to make these lavender ones. They'd pick the, pick this long sprig of lavender and wrap ribbon around it and then stick it in a drawer uh, because those drawers nowadays they have drawers like in your kitchen if you have a new kitchen you get drawers that have little holes in them for air but the old ones didn't so if you left your dish towels in there you left you left if you had uh, drawers for your clothing that that could start to smell pretty bad after a while because it was just so stuffy in there and there was there wasn't any air rosemary this rejuvenating scent contains oils that are great for cleaning many surfaces, such as dishware. So I'm going to try that. I've got lot. I've got a huge bush of rosemary growing out there. I would probably put it in water and, and uh, boil it or something first, and then strain it into a into a container. So those are just a few household tips, and I got those from uh, an old magazine that I had around here so you can't probably can't get this so I won't even tell you what it is so ladies I hope that this has been helpful to you and that it hasn't been um, a burden on you or irritating what I would like to do is to be able to keep you company while you do something and I have calculated that in 45 minutes you might be able to do a bedroom or a bathroom or do your kitchen. It's going to take me a little longer to do my kitchen because I'm, uh, you know, I don't like rushing through things, so I don't rush. I just take my time and listen to some music, maybe listen to some uh, wives and daughters, and I just take my time. So it takes me a lot longer because I, I want to think about what I'm doing. I don't want to just rush and, and just throw everything away. I want, I mean, put it away in, the, in a hurry and. I want to be aware of what I am doing. So I'm a little bit more slow than some of you. But I do appreciate you coming and I'm flattered that you would use this video for helping you get your work done. So I do hope you will leave me a comment. I really, really like your comments and really appreciate them. And one of the reasons that I'm doing these videos is that I can tell you what I believe, what I think, and what I um, what I promote so that if you hear or read anything different you know that you heard it straight from me and uh, you can reject what you heard if it was a little bit strange so and we want to talk sometime about other things like uh, children and marriage and uh, cooking but for now I've divided it into three sections and that's your appearance your homemaking and the people part and I hope that this has been helpful to you. And please write me and tell me if there's anything that would help. And I will try my best. can't say that I can, but I'll try to talk about it if I have any knowledge of it. So until then, I hope you have a wonderful success with your home. I hope you, have a, hope you can sleep well tonight because your home looks good and smells good and, and then you're happy. And so I hope you're happy at home. And that, that is one way to be happy at home is to get it in the shape that you want it. And this reminds me, before I go, that Mr. S. said to me when we first got married, you're the one that's going to be sitting here or, or working in here. So you decorate it the way you want it, whatever it takes to make you happy. That's the way the men were, you know, in the olden days. And he was born in 1946, and uh, men always wanted the women to be happy at home. So he said, whatever you want me to paint it a different color, I'll do it. Because I know you have to be here. You have to live here. He said, I've got to go out every day, but you, you've got to stay here sometimes. Now, he did something really odd the other day. <laughs> we were in church, and he was talking about how uh, I had gotten up and gone over to the meeting house and unlocked it at 6 in the morning, and it was dark, and it was so dreary, and it was raining and everything, and that I turned on the heat, turned on the lights, unlocked all the doors, and set out the communion and all this, and Normally, I don't say anything about it. I've been doing it for years. And he said, and she comes over here, and she does this, and she does that. And then he said, and you women, quit looking at me like that. I have to preach, so she has to do all that. <laughs> I don't think that he, I don't think that's helpful, do you? 
So I told him, don't talk about me anymore. <laughs> anyway, I hope you have a lovely time and that, that your house is what you want it to be. And so until next time, um, I hope that all goes well and God bless you and see you next time. Bye.